and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk, exploring the issues affecting all of our lives. I'm your host, Austin Harris. On today's episode, our guest has spent over 40 years in the music industry, performing locally, regionally, and internationally. He's a skilled producer, performing artist, singer, and a songwriter. And the best part is, he is one of our own. As such, Let's Talk is proud to sit down with the man himself, Jean Eric Smith, better known as Mr. Notch. Jean Eric, welcome to Let's Talk. It's a pleasure to have you as our guest in studios. Thank you, my brother. Much appreciated. Pleasure to be here. Great to have you. Well, you know, we like to uh, start off by getting to know a little bit about our guests uh, and the background. So maybe tell us and our audiences a little bit about yourself, uh, your background, what you know, what got you into music, where that passion came from, um, and perhaps what early mentors um, were some of your guiding lights guiding you down this path that you spent the last 40 years doing? Uh, I was christened Jean Eric Smith, not Sean Smith, as most people in Cayman knew me throughout my younger and adolescent years. Mm -hmm. uh, that was primarily because my countrymen had a difficulty in pronouncing the name Jean, mm -hmm. a French name, uh, which came from one of our first um, investors, Mr. Jean Yves Doucet, mm -hmm. um, who was instrumental in my birth. Um, so the name Eric comes from my father, who was actually um, one of Cayman's more popular singers of yesteryear. Okay. Uh, my father comes from Belize and he was imported to the Cayman Islands in 1968 as a police officer. Married my mom in 69 and I'm a product of theirs the year after. Um, you know, growing up in West Bay, I always knew that I could sing, um, even at primary school, um, because my father was a singer. And he was always rehearsing um, and writing out um, and writing out the lyrics to songs. I actually subconsciously learnt a lot of songs, mm -hmm. so I would be able to go to school and I could always perform the most current songs on the radio for all of my schoolmates. Um, whether it was, yeah, anyway, Sydney Burnett. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, but anyway, I just remember that for some strange reason that okay. came up into the picture. Uh, yeah, so ultimately it was my father's, um, it's it's a Smith, your you birthright, I think. I see. Um, I have uncles who are performers up until today right. in California, Smith Brothers and um, the New Wave Band, King Rancho, my okay. uncle. Uh, so yeah, basically it's in the blood. It was a musical family, you would say. Absolutely. The Smiths are from Rancho Dolores, Belize. Okay. Hmm. How old were you when you first sang, performed, perhaps before an audience, uh, big or small? Uh, the Georgetown Town Hall, 1978, mm -hmm. um, at a talent competition that my mom had, had several... Um, several competitors in Nina Orit was one of them. Okay, yes. Um, and Gina Wilson, Danita Bauer now. Uh, but anyway, these they were they used to do the We Are Family, Sister Sledge. Okay. And um, they were short on a repertoire. They were short on performers. And um, they asked me to do a song, so I went up and did uh, Bruce Springsteen's um, fire. Okay. Yeah. Good song. Strong song for a relatively young man. Uh, -uh. <laughs> but you pulled it off. Yeah, man. All right. Bass line and all go in the same time, you know? Wow. It was bad. Wow. Yeah. So that got a good response. But, um, like I said, even from primary school, I knew that my friends gravitated towards my voice. Um, a few years after that, um, at the agriculture showground which was then held at the Smith Road Oval which is now off Thomas Russell Way yes 
Uh, that used to be a real national gathering, you yes, know? Yes. Before we had expanded our airport and came out, it was more quaint in the 70s. Everybody would be there. Right. You didn't have to go all the way up to Savannah to go to the agricultural ground. Right. And um, for the first time, I saw my father perform. So that's when I really, it all clicked. Mm -hmm. This is what I need to do. Okay. This is how I do it. All right. Well, it's safe to say that you were somewhat, if not indeed, a child prodigy, uh, musically mm. speaking. And your amateur career soon spread into your professional career, yeah. uh, all at a relative young age. You were still a young man, if not a young boy, when your a professional boy. career began. Mm. As a matter of fact, if memory serves correct, it was you and I believe four other similarly yeah. aged young men who would go on to uh, call themselves aptly the juveniles when your professional career began. Talk to us about the juveniles era and of course your introduction as a young boy into the world of professional music. You know, um, this is where it all becomes a bit of feat. Um, I started the Westbury Primary School in 1974 and I would have finished in 1980 and went to the Cayman Islands Middle School, which was when our government had just started the junior high, um, implementing junior high into the educational curriculum, into, into the educational um, system. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so um, I, I, was, I was nine at the time and I couldn't graduate from the Westbury Primary School even though I had exemplary grades on the national achievement test level mm -hmm. because I wouldn't be 10 that year. So all the kids who were going to be 10 that year got to go to the middle school and right. had to repeat. By repeating, I ended up in the middle school the year after my original primary school class. Mm -hmm. And that year, I met Steve McDermott who happened to be held back a year as well mm -hmm. because he had been knocked down on a um, on a bicycle right. by the Georgetown Primary School. So he was a year older and justifiably in the year above, but he had got held back and I got held back yes. because of my age. We ended up in... Um, we ended up in Mr. James Wattle, James Seymour's tutorial class, okay. room number five. Um, and me always singing, singing, and him playing on the desks, he suggested that we form a band. Okay. So I said, well, you know, I, I'd love that. My dad's a singer. Who's your dad? Ray, Ray, Ray. And suddenly he came back and said his brother knew my dad. And it so turned out that at that time, my dad had just left the Settlers Band. Mm -hmm. uh, the Lonelies Come Boy had become Settlers which was the first time I'd seen him just recently before that. That was a quick transition. They had moved from being the Lonelies Combo to Settlers. And then my dad had left Settlers to start being the lead singer of K-Man Edition. Mm -hmm. And that transition had opened up an opportunity for Randolph McDermott, Steve's brother, to actually um, start to play in the Settlers. Okay. So Steve introduced me to his brother that Pirates Week of 1980. We'd have started school in September. That would have been around October those times. Pirates Week was in October. Mm -hmm. um, and he invited me to a rehearsal on North Sound Road. Ironic, Sound Road. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, <clears throat> and my mom took me one night. She had just gotten her um, driver's license. I'll never forget. That was a big deal. My mom up until that time had been, like most women in Cayman, they, they didn't drive. Yeah. Um, so she took me to, um, she took me to the rehearsal and just dropped me off, left me there. I walked and it was really dark and dank and they were playing music and every song that they called out <coughs> in the repertoire for every song that they knew that they had rehearsed, I knew. Um, and I was in key and knew the lyrics, ready to perform them even there in the darkness. Mm -hmm. And um, Randolph started to make a repertoire for the band, a performing repertoire, little did I know. 
So I guess that would have been 1980. I always say I started in 1981, but 1981 was when we started to play at Galleon Beach. Okay. So we just kept rehearsing. Randolph at the time was an aspiring pilot, but um, he worked at Galleon Beach Hotel and he knew the manager there very well, or the night manager, Miss Valerie Lowe. And he invited her to a rehearsal and she would say, oh my God, let's get these boys on stage. And that's where the juvenile started performing. All right. Uh, All six right. months later, things happened really fast those days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, things happened really fast after Miss Val came. I think she came around my birthday, the end of March, to listen to the band. So we had then at that stage been recording, uh, been rehearsing about three months. Mm -hmm. uh, those days I was also an athlete. So I was a member of the Barefoot Brigade originally with Mr. Jerry Harper. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd run four miles after middle school in the afternoon in the hot sun, bare feet. And um, then walk from the middle school on Walker's Road all the way to Sound Road to a week rehearsal that okay. evening. So yeah, pretty much that was my routine for the first part of middle school until we started to perform. I see. And Miss Val had got permission from, Gallon Beach would have gotten permission from Exco that it would have been okay for these minors to perform where they were selling alcohol. Mm -hmm. And the first gig we had was with Lenny Lloyd and Breeze. So you would have had to, I mean, you, the band itself would have had to have received a special dispensation from the exec executive council or cabinet at that mm. time to make that possible for minors Absolutely. to perform in the infamous Galleon Beach, but it was in fact a very much an adult setting. Absolutely. So here it was, we were actually performing for my, for, 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 the, for the parents of my peers. I see. So I'd be out singing at night, people would see me and go, or I'd see their parents and I go say, so your mom, the last night, so your dad, the last night, or they were at the dance, or right. kids would come to school and say, oh, my mom, since she heard you last night, and it sounded so good, or, mm -hmm. or you guys did a great job, or whatever. So it was kind of that encouragement back and forth from among our peers and right. among Cayman's people at the time, because that was really a new advent for Cayman to have a young recording, young performing band that would soon be a recording band. Indeed. The juveniles were hugely popular in their generation. My generation. Yeah, our generation. Um, some might say they were ahead of their time. Um, where did the opportunity or the support for this young group of young performers come from that enabled them, I believe, to produce one album and three chart-topping singles? Uh, Randolph was the driving force behind the band um, as an elder you know he would have been those days he I remember that when I first met Randolph um, he was playing guitar for the settlers but he was also um, a teacher's aide or a teacher's assistant at the Cayman Islands High School mm -hmm. in the lab and stuff with um, different different teachers um, Mr. McLeod and all them, they needed, I guess, people to help them with putting away all the chemicals and different stuff mm -hmm. and cleaning up. And, and he also did the, um, the crosswalk. Okay. At, you know, you put on the thing and you direct the kids across the street. So mm -hmm. I'd see him on the bus when I was leaving, but I didn't realize. But anyway, he became um, the mentor and the driving force behind the band. Hubert and Lloyd, um, Hubert was the youngest of the band. He was still in Georgetown Primary when we started, actually. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He was on his way to middle school when we started. I see. He was just finishing Georgetown Primary. Um, and I had just met... Um, anyway, so he, they had an older brother. In, um, they had an older brother, Dennis. Dennis uh, used to play the bass. Randolph played guitar. And they would play along with us. Mm -hmm. So Lloyd on keyboards, Hubert on guitar, me on guitar. Because uh, that, that time I'd started going to Dr. Melano McCoy. Mm -hmm. um, he was a music teacher. Yeah. He was Lloyd's music teacher even before that. So pretty much, and Steve Randolph was teaching him how to play the drums, you know. Okay. 
And then um, eventually we incorporated Sean Clark later on when we phased out Dennis mm -hmm. to have a young bass player. Right. And Hubert and I took over guitar responsibilities from Randolph for a little while until I kind of slacked away from guitar responsibilities altogether. Right. Just to concentrate on being a front man. Right. Right. You know, and which was important. Sure. Yeah. Where did... As important. Where did the moniker Mr. Notch... Uh, first get its rise <laughs> um, you know throughout all this um, as I said previously um, in 1979 I was um, I was a second place finisher in the national achievement test mm -hmm. so when I went to middle school I was actually the following year I had finished fourth place in in, in, in the nation mm -hmm. and um, so I was put into all the top sets middle school for academics and then being a sprinter and a long distance runner I was also an athlete and now I had become quickly a musician and a performer and starting to become very popular as a singer so um, growing with that as the juveniles grew uh, the juveniles broke up in about 85 uh, we kind of separated Steve wasn't doing very well in school and his parents had tried him in Jamaica. He was a bit distracted or whatever, so they didn't put him in Triple C when they brought him back for a bit. And um, I finished school in 86, mm -hmm. came to Lance High School, went and did two years of, um, of, of university in New York before I came home. And when I came home and met the guys, we rebanded under the name UBU. And then we were more commercial-minded having traveled and came out was starting to take on the technology mtv was out more popular and so we realized oh well it was cool to have a a name mm -hmm. as a performer yeah and uh hubert and lloyd gave me that name notch okay hubert was ub sean clark was ace uh lloyd was germs because he was nasty on the keyboards. <laughs> okay, all right. He was nasty anyway, but <laughs> just kid like. Um, and Steve was the mucky duck. Mucky duck. Mucky. Okay. okay. You know, but um, yeah, so that's us. All right. Well, like all great musical collaborations, um, they break up. Hmm. And so too was the case for the juveniles and then UBU. But Mr. Notch went on to even greater things as a frontman. As a matter of fact, I believe you became lead singer for three of K Man's top bands um, in the 80s, early 90s. Talk to us about life after the Juveniles. Juveniles disbanded. We rebanded as UBU. And then, um, ironically, Juana started the year Bob Marley had died in 1981. <clears throat> that was the same time that Rita Marley had started Ziggy Marley and the Melody Makers. And uh, coincidentally, the producer of the Juveniles album, Grub Cooper mm -hmm. of Fab Five, who um, I actually produced um, one of the PPM's um, um, campaign songs with. Oh, really? I did, absolutely. Okay. That's that, that's on my resume. Um, okay. But anyway, Grub was also the main producer for the Melody Makers. So we had a close relationship in the fact that her first album was released on Tough Gong label, on Bob Marley's label. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it was just smart business sense on the part of Eureka Marley to sign us up and then to kind of shelf the album because it would have been competition for her her children's band mm -hmm. who she wanted that, at that time to be alone representing reggae as, as youngsters you know naive as we were we didn't realize at the time and that was part of the reason for the juveniles disbanding I see so um, when we regrouped as UBU uh, ironically Cedric in Brooks came to the Cayman Islands and he had been a saxophone player in Bob Marley's band Okay. his touring band, the Whalers. <clears throat> and um, Cedric came to Cayman, I think, to get married and move to the Brack, where he later became a school teacher, mm -hmm. <clears throat> teaching music to a lot of locals. Um, but anyway, 
before that, I had met Cedric at the local 12 tribes, the Rasta chapter um, in West Bay, Everard Hides and Jamich and them. I knew Jamich is a musician. Mm -hmm. He wasn't my guitarist yet, right. but I knew of him. We okay. came from the same street. Yes. And um, I met Cedric and we hit it off. And next thing you know, he told me he was looking for a band and he came and approached the band, UBU, and asked us to be his backing band in Cayman. Mm -hmm. He tried to change the name of the band to Journey. There was already a journey. You can't mm -hmm. recreate Journey. Right. But um, for the for, for the interim, we kind of entertained it. And we did Shanghai on the Bay at those days. They had jazz in their cafe. Mm -hmm. And it was good for us because we were always a diverse band playing a lot of... Um, Playing a lot of top forty and various other stuff. What was the name of the band? G Journey. Journey. He changed the name to Journey, and but Juveniles also had a similar work ethic, and that we would learn everything that was out there. Mm -hmm. We tried to perform everything or recreate yes. everything that was out there. So with Cedric, it just gave us a bit more discipline, a bit more structure, um, professionalism of how to approach that. And um, after we finished with Cedric, that was pretty much the end of the Juveniles Ensemble. Sean Clark, um, the, we just, he was at the time, you know, we were all growing up. Everybody right. was going through different things. And for whatever the reason was, Sean um, was no longer in the band. And we recruited Bugs, Roger Wilson, yeah. as a bass player into the band, which Bugs is still here today, married now with... Yeah. Came on family and, and still um, performing and still performing yeah. and he still performs with me right 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 i actually took out his first permit to get him to stay on the island and he stayed with um with the mom of my twins at the time okay well my twins weren't born yet yes. but yeah so um yeah so i just come home um not only had the band rebanded but i'd started to work in hotel tourism um, so I was working in hotel tourism at the Hyatt Regency Grand Cayman and um, the band was playing at Shanghai on the Bay. Uh, when we disbanded, we had made the decision at that time to start to, we were toying with the name Tabia, but um, for whatever reason, um, like I said, we were growing up and going through different things and the usual story of bands breaking up, it happened over girls, I won't say who. Okay, good. We are... Uh, we decided to um, go our separate ways. Mm -hmm. um, I had just left the Hyatt Regency Grand Cayman working in their accounts department. I had moved through the ranks of hotel accounting um, from cashier all the way up to accounting. And um, I had just started to work at a Grand Pavilion Hotel. Juvenile, UBU had broke up maybe two weeks and Sean Hennings came to see me in the lobby and said, Edward Solomon, who is one of the local icons, has um, Dr. Melno McCoy is also an icon, ironically, and so is Melvin Augustine. All these guys have been a part of my musical journey. Yes. Um, Edward Solomon had, had the contract for Treasure Island Silvers. Local musicians um, had been successful. The Music Association at the time, right. came on Music Association was what it was called then, had been successful in getting um, Treasure Island to recognize that they should give the contract to locals, and Edward had it, and he needed a lead singer. Right. He was having health issues, and um, uh, Sean was like, how much does it pay? $100 a night, five nights a week. I think I was making 3000 CI, which was more than that at the time, mm -hmm. and I just walked in and wrote my resignation at the on the desk for Mr. Bob Moyle, mm -hmm. God rest his soul, who was then the um, controller of the Grand Pavilion Hotel. Right. He had just hired me as his assistant controller. Right, right. I'd been there for maybe eight months at that time. Wow. And this is Bob Moyle, the, the husband of the late Edna, Edna Moyle, Moyle, speaker of the house. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Absolutely. Small world. It's, it's a small island. Smaller, and, smaller island. Right, right. Absolutely. We all, six degrees of separation. What was the name of the band that played Silvers? Uh, mainstream. Okay. So mainstream had the contract, and then we started to realize that there was things going on, and we evolved. 
and became a smaller nucleus of the band called Sweet FX. Sweet FX took over the contract there and at Shenanigans for the longest time, which was one of the more popular bands. Um, when Sweet FX decided to split, I started Club Dread. Okay. Club Dread then was, I had went to, this is after I came back from Atlanta. So, <laughs> Sean Hennings and I and Jamich and Sweet FX, the core members of Sweet FX, left, came out and went to meet Randolph, who started the Juveniles in Texas, mm -hmm. where he had then migrated to live. He had created his own recording studio, had a whole setup in his house, and we were trying to record some stuff there with him as Club Dread. We didn't have a full complement of musicians, so we imported some of the guys that we knew who had played in Silvers on contract that were living in America, Rob Lau, different people. And we have some good songs that we recorded from that that were still never released. Yes. Just like with the Juvenile second album. Yes. Um, anyway, so Steve McDermott at the time had moved to Atlanta. So I drove to Atlanta to meet Steve after Sean and Mitch had flew back home and we started living in Atlanta playing music. When we came back to Cayman, in Atlanta I met a guy called Julian Nelson who took me to Jamaica and put me on shows in Jamaica as a singer mm -hmm. with other band. Um, and the backing band was 809, Jamaica's most prominent. That was all, all of our area code in the Caribbean at the time. Right, right. But that was Jamaica's leading band, um, headed with headed by Dean Fraser. So um, that's where I started to get a real network of musicians from Jamaica right. that I could work with, which got me into starting Club Dread. I see. And then Club Dread, when I came back home, Sean Hennings, to continue Club Dread. Mm -hmm. Club Dread had started before, but that was a continuation. Sean had moved on and kind of started to play with Shane again. Mm -hmm. So that was going to be the beginning of High Tide. Right. They were going to go on and do their thing. Me and Jamich were still together. And Bugs at that time was playing hard with Tabia. Mm -hmm. So Tabia was touring and doing stuff. So it was just me and Mitch. So then I brought in some of the best guys from Jamaica that I knew to just to work and to sustain because we got to eat. Right. So at that time it was Benjamin Myers, who is known throughout Jamaica on, as a bass player and singer, Paul Castic on drums, Norris Webb, who now plays with Third World, who then at that time was playing previously with Diana King. And those guys kind of became my musical family imported. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Bugs. Uh, earlier on, and you also had a, a band with Bugs and others called In Transit. In Transit was a way of working more. So, you know, as a musician, you have to find ways to be innovative. Yes. Um, we had a big band, but people don't like, employers don't like to pay a lot of money for a big band. Right. Right. Sadly, the heritage of Cayman is big bands. But the future of k doesn't seem to be big bands. Mm. It's smaller combos, DJs for entertainment, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So it's more financially prudent to have a smaller combo. Well, that's all the time we have today. But just a reminder to tune in on Thursday, where we will continue part two of this fantastic and inspirational conversation we're having with John Eric Smith, better known as Mr. Notch. To our audiences, if you enjoyed today's episode, please remember to like, share, and subscribe to our channel, and don't be afraid to leave us a comment or two. Tune in to Let's Talk every Tuesday and Thursday at 4 p.m. I'm your host, Austin Harris. Until next time.